In this video, I'm going to tell you about Fisher's exact test. This is a test that's an alternative to the chi-square test for testing whether or not distributions of some variable are the same for different groups. The test goes back actually quite a long way to a statistician by the name of Ronald Fisher. And the story is that he was at a party. It was actually a tea party uh, in the early 20th century, and he and his friends got in an argument. Okay? There was a woman at the tea party who said, I can tell when someone makes tea whether they put in the milk first or they put in the tea first. Okay. Well, well, Ronald Fisher thought this was ridiculous, and there's no way that she could actually be able to tell this sort of thing, um, that both, both cups of tea should taste exactly the same. And so he developed an experiment, okay? and he ran it with his friends right then and there, where what he did is he made four cups of tea. He made four cups. Uh, well, he first made, he made four cups with tea first, and then he made another four cups with milk first. Okay, but he didn't tell this woman which was which. And then he proceeded to mix up the cups and serve them to the woman who proceeded to taste the tea and guess which one was which. And the idea was that if he had his tea first and his milk first cups, and she was going to guess some were tea, and she was going to guess some were milk. What he thought is she's just going to guess randomly, and the distribution of her guesses should be about the same. Whether it's tea actual, whether she's actually having tea, or whether she's actually having milk. So what he was expecting is she was going to guess something like this. She was going to guess for all four four of the, there were four teas and four milks, and she was going to guess both, and he thought he was, she was going to end up something like this, okay, but, um, whoa, but what he was actually, um, and so she guessed, okay, and what she guessed, uh, what she guessed was actually not two and two, but something else. Um, and so what we think she guessed is she got three rights and maybe one wrong here and one wrong here, and maybe three right there. So suppose she had guessed that. Um, seems like that's pretty good. She's doing well. Uh, but maybe she does that well just by chance. And so what he wanted to do was compute the probability that she would guess so well that he would have to reject the null hypothesis that she was just guessing randomly, that she actually knew what she was doing. And so here's the smart thing that he did is he figured out that the distribution of this number right here, uh, so the number of guess it of times where she guessed t first and it was actually t first that number is actually under the null that she was just guessing randomly um, that number is actually a draw from a hypergeometric distribution okay so what the heck is a hypergeometric distribution well a hyper geometric distribution uh, occurs, and I'm going to do this in terms of urns and balls, because that's how it goes when we've got um, basic statistics and basic counting, because we do it in terms of urns and balls. So I want you to imagine that we've got some n balls in this urn. So n is number balls. Okay, And there's two different kinds of balls in here. There's going to be some, we're going to call those the T-balls, okay? And there are some, and we're going to call those the M-balls. And you can think about these as the milk balls and the, and the T-balls if you want, okay? And there's going to be R, R that are 
our t balls, and then we've got n minus r that are our milk balls. Okay. Now imagine somebody's just randomly digging around in there. And they dig around, uh, and in this case, let's say they dig around, um, they grab m balls. So we're going to, m's going to be the number grabbed up. Okay. Now, n, r, and m define the hypergeometric distribution, and the random variable is going to be the number of t-balls uh, that are grabbed. Okay, so let's think about this for a minute. What's the smallest number that x can be? Well, it's zero. You could grab none. Okay, what's the most it can be? Well, it's going to be m. So m, x is going to range from zero to m. And there's going to be some probability that it's 0, some probability that it's 1, and so forth, all the way up to m. And that probability is going to depend on how many balls are in there, how many are going to be t, and how many are milk. So what's the distribution of balls inside this urn? Okay, this is an urn. My drawing's not so good. I like to label things. All right, so the hypergeometric distribution. Why is that? Why does that have anything to do with what's over here? Okay, because this is a hypergeometric. Okay, what's going on here is the woman, each time she guesses, okay, she's going to guess by pulling balls out of the urn over here. Okay, and how many balls are in the urn? Well, in this case, n's eight. There's Eight balls in the urn. How many of them are actually T? Well, we know that one too. That's going to be four. And how many did she grab? Well, she's going to grab M. Okay. Here we take it from the data. Okay. We see what she did. She grabbed four. Okay. She grabbed four the first time guessing T. Okay. She's going to grab four the next time guessing milk. And the key here is... If her, she's just guessing randomly, what's going to happen is that draw from guessing T and that draw from guessing milk, these two actually are going to have identical distributions. So we expect that those numbers um, should be similar. In this case, we expect them to be identical because she made the same number of T guesses as she did milk guesses. But the point is the same fraction of her guesses uh, should be actually T, whether she's guessing T or she's guessing milk. Okay. Now, what's the? How do we actually compute how strange this number is? How and how extreme is it? How do we compute that? Well, we say what's the probability that she would choose a number this extreme? Okay. Um, what we expect it to be, the mean. We got a three. And so what we want to do is we want to compute the probability that the number is 3 or higher, so 1 away on top, or 1 or lower, so 1 away on the bottom, one, one or more away on the bottom, that far away. Well, okay, that's fine, but how do we compute the probabilities of each of those possible values? Well, that's where the PMF, the probability mass function for the hypergeometric, comes into play. We say that number, which we're going to call y11, okay, that number, uh, the probability that y11 equals any particular value has this kind of an, kind of ugly form. It's r choose c times n minus r m minus c all over n choose m, okay? And so in this case, it's actually not so hard to compute. Um, this is the Fisher's exact test, the simplest case where it's a two by two matrix, uh, but the logic is actually fairly similar. 
and when you generalize this to two by three or two by or three by two or even higher than that, the problem, of course, is that when the numbers get very large, you've got to compute a lot of these. So big numbers, okay, in your cells, large more than two or three rows, more than two or three columns. What that gives you is big computation. Uh, it gets very hard for a computer to do it as soon as things get large. That's why we do chi-square tests instead of Fisher's exact tests most of the time. All right, so um, I guess I should tell you what happened. Because when people tell the, the Fisher's exact T story, uh, they usually stop there and they say, boy, that Ron Fisher, he was a really smart guy to come up with this. Um, what you don't hear very often is what actually happened. And what actually happened is the woman guessed extremely well. Okay? And Fisher actually had to reject the null that she was guessing randomly. And so who ends up being the smart one here? Well, I mean, I would argue maybe it was the woman because she was right in guessing that um, she really – that. She really could tell whether the tea was added first or the milk was added first. All right. Thanks for listening.